Although it seems simple in form, the rope shows up in a lot of video games. From Jungle Hunt's vines and Super Metroid's grappling beam, to precarious supports in Angry Birds and the means of delivering food to Omnom, ropes are a vital fixture in many games. I even hear there was a rope item in level 3 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I could never make it past the seaweed. And although it seems simple in form, the rope actually manifests some complicated physics. For example, how much should a rope curve when it's swinging back and forth? How does its velocity change as a hero swings from it? And at what angle should it slow to a stop? How much stretch should a rope have? Or what if a section of rope is resting on a table? How much should be hanging off for it to begin to slide? Hello and welcome back to Let's Code Physics. Uh, today we are starting a new series in which we're going to simulate the uh, physics of a rope. Uh, this is of interest in various uh, game environments um, where you might have a character swinging from a rope, you might have an object dangling from a rope, uh, you might need to launch a rope from one location to another. Uh, and so it's very important to get the physics of that correct because that's something that a player would have sort of an intuitive feeling for uh, based on the real world and you would want the, the experience in the game to match the experience in the real world. So it turns out that the most common way to model ropes in a video game is as a series of atoms connected by springs. So everything at, uh, oh, excuse me, all of normal matter that we encounter in the, in the everyday world is composed of, uh, of, of regular matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons that are collected into atoms. And those atoms are held together by forces. So the way you model a rope is actually really similar to that. You just connect a group of points together. Uh, you could call them atoms, you could call them elements, you could call them chunks, and you connect them together by springs. So the idea is that between each neighboring pair of atoms, you've got a spring. So for right now, let's just think about uh, just having three atoms and two springs or three chunks of rope connected by two springs. You can add on more as you need to. Um, the, the reason you model it as a spring is because these rope elements like to be a certain length from each other. So when you think about a rope, you think about it being a certain length. It maybe has a little bit of give, maybe compresses a little bit, but it everything seems to like to rest in that nice little equilibrium spot. And the spring force is the easiest way to, uh, to model that equilibrium seeking force. Uh, so for example, suppose you've got uh, two elements, call them one and two. Uh, there's going to be a force between one and two uh, that pulls this one this way. Uh, let's call that force of one on two and then back the other way, the force of two on one. Um, you'll notice that the, the, the numbers flip there because the direction is flipping. This is really just an example of Newton's third law, that the force of two on one is equal to the negative of the force of one on two. If they're the same magnitude, just opposite directions. Um, <clears throat> the way this force works for a spring is that it's going to be the, uh, it's going to involve a few things. It's going to have a negative sign in front of it because it's always going to be pointing opposite of the direction that it's been stretched. It's going to have a constant on there uh, that we sometimes call the spring constant or the spring stiffness. Um, <clears throat> and then it's going to be multiplied by the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length of the spring. So this L0 here is a real important quantity. This is sort of the natural length of the spring. Uh, this is the distance that if you let the system come to equilibrium, this is the distance that the two atoms will sort of settle in on. Um, and so the idea is that the farther you stretch it, the more it's going to pull back. The more you compress it, the more it's going to push outward. And then, of course, this... Um, this force over here is a vector, meaning it needs a magnitude and a direction. What we have over here so far is just a magnitude. We have to give it a direction. Uh, we use a little tool for that called a unit vector. Um, this L hat, the hat just indicates that it's a unit vector, meaning it's pure direction. It has a magnitude of one. And so this is just the direction between the atoms. And what you do is you, you, you calculate this force for each pair of atoms or for each pair of chunks. So for example, uh, here you've got uh, you know, the force between uh, 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 atom one and atom two. Then you would have to also calculate the force between two and three. So you've got the next pair going. So this would be the force, between, force of two on three, 
This would be the force of three on two. Again, it's all calculated by uh, it's all calculated by this equation here. It's just a matter of flipping the direction uh, for the for the atoms. If we're depending on the atom you're looking at. So for example, atom two, the one in the middle is gonna experience both of these two forces. It's gonna experience the force from one and it's gonna experience the force from three. Whereas the one at the bottom is only gonna experience this force going this way. This one's only gonna experience this force going this way. This L hat here, this direction of the force, um, is going to vary based on the two springs. You can see I've got this one at a little bit uh, uh, more of a vertical angle. This one's coming out a little bit more horizontally. So this L hat also changes depending on the angle that the, that the spring is made. So I've gone ahead and started a code to work with this. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this yesterday. I've, I've learned I don't necessarily need to show you every line of every code being written, um, especially when this one I, I pulled straight out of uh, Shabay and Sherwood's Matter and Interactions. Uh, really good textbook. It teaches programming from the very first semester the student begins uh, their study, so I really value it. Um, and this uh, calculation of the spring force is straight out of their uh, straight out of their textbook. So we'll come back to the initial conditions in a little bit. Right now what we're looking at is the loop. Uh, you've seen this, you know, a, a dozen times on this channel now. If you're new to the channel, please, well, first of all, welcome. Uh, please go back to season one. Check out those first uh, couple series uh, about this thing called the Euler-Cromer algorithm that we use a lot. Um, uh, like I said earlier, we need to be calculating the force that these springs exert. We're going to have uh, we're going to have three balls on the on the screen. We have three atoms. The top ball, the middle ball, and the bottom ball, which I've called top ball, middle ball, and bottom ball. You know because that makes sense. Um, and so for each step in the loop, it needs to calculate the length of the top spring. That's the spring between the middle ball and the top ball. It then has to calculate the unit vector for that direction. Uh, so that's just taking the uh, the vector that we calculated up here and dividing it by its magnitude. Anytime you divide a vector by its magnitude, you get a unit vector because by definition, that new vector, that L hat, is going to have a magnitude of one. Uh, then we need to calculate this distance. So this is that L minus L zero. So this is how far apart the, the atoms are minus the natural length of the spring. And then here is just the force of the spring. Uh, so again, it's negative spring constant times the amount it's been stretched or compressed by times the L hat to give it the direction. So it's this last piece that turns it from being a number into a vector. It gives it a direction. And then of course, since we've got two springs, we've got to do the same thing again for the next pair. So this uh, this next section just repeats that calculation for the bottom ball to the middle ball. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this thing is not going, our rope is not going to swing uh, very convincingly if we don't have gravity. So we've also got a force of gravity acting in the y direction, well, the negative y direction. So that's where this vector comes in here. To, again, this is, this, these are just numbers that give, the, that give the force its size. And this is the unit vector. It gives it a direction. It'll always be pointing down. Um, we will come back to this energy calculation in just a minute after we've taken a look at the uh, at the animation. And so this is uh, again Euler-Cromer algorithm, just like we've done a few times. Um, uh, in order to in order to to move the, the 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 middle spring and the bottom spring, we've got to calculate the the forces on them. What I'm going to do for right now is leave that top spring. Um, locked in place so that the rope, hopefully, if this thing does successfully model a rope, it'll swing back and forth with that top atom in place and those uh, uh, middle and, and bottom atoms uh, swinging back and forth like a rope. So we have to calculate the force on the top ball. I should actually specify that, as, or excuse me, middle ball. I should specify that as the middle ball there. Um, <clears throat> And then we've got the force on the bottom ball. So, so if it doesn't have a number on it, it applies to the middle ball. If it does have a number on it, it applies to the bottom ball. Here we're updating their velocities. Uh, this is middle vel, middle velocity, not mid-level. I just realized that that could be pronounced mid-level. Um, so we're updating the middle ball's velocity and position. Then we update the bottom ball's, bottom ball's velocity and position. Doesn't really matter which one we do first because... Uh, you know, we've already calculated the forces. And then we also have to update the springs. So I've created two springs um, in VPython. Uh, a spring has to, have two has to have two properties. It's got to have 
a uh, it's got to have a position so we have to update where each of them begins and then it's got to have an axis and that just tells you what direction they each point in and then of course we're incrementing time forward um, all the the three balls and the two springs are set up up here at the at the top um, their colors are going to be blue red and green uh, so you know that way we can tell them apart pretty easily let's hit f5 and run this code Okay, so I've started them out at kind of an angle. I've got the angles of each spring just a little bit differently so that the so that the red ball and the green ball are kind of operating a bit independently. And you can see it swings back and forth just like we would expect. Let's maximize that to get a better view of it. There we go. So it swings back and forth kind of like you would expect for a rope. Um, it does curve out a little bit when it reaches uh, its, its outermost extent. You notice they're bouncing a little bit. Um, I've deliberately made these springs a little bit strong and I've put their original positions pretty close to the equilibrium position so that way they're not bouncing wildly. You know, you don't see a spring, or excuse me, you don't see a, a rope doing that. A rope remains more or less the same length. So this has just a little bit of give to it. Um, so you can see it kind of curves out there so so they don't all stay so they don't all three stay in a line there that one got a nice little angle to it just like you would expect a rope would you would expect a rope to develop some curvature so one of the things we'll look for as we add more um more elements onto this rope uh, uh <clears throat> we should expect to see that curvature get a little bit more realistic um so i have shown you where the force calculation comes from i've shown you the animation um, now, of course, the question is, is this actually physically modeling a rope or is it just, you know, is it just doing a nice little fun animation? Um, if this thing is working, if this code really is working, then the total amount of energy for the system should be conserved. Um, so <clears throat> Richard Feynman uh, made this analogy about, about energy where he said that the universe is like a, like a three-year-old that is in, a, that is in a, a nursery or in their, their bedroom. And they've been given a set of 20 blocks. You know, maybe they're the little, you know, letter blocks or something like that. And the, th the three-year-old can hide the blocks anywhere. They can, the, the, the three-year-old can, can put the block under a pillow. Uh, uh, they can put them in the crib. They can put them in the closet. They can maybe get them up onto a windowsill or something. But when the, when the, when the, when the nanny comes in, the nanny being the physicist, I don't know what it says that Richard Feynman thinks of him thought, or thought of himself as the universe's nanny. That's another topic for another time. But when the physicist, the nanny, comes in, uh, the, the physicist is looking uh, for the blocks, and the physicist is going to find all twenty blocks because the child cannot destroy any blocks, and the child cannot create any new blocks. All the child can do is move around where the blocks are stored. And that's literally what the universe does with energy. Uh, the universe cannot create any more energy. It can't destroy any energy. It can't lose it. It can't go out to the store and get more it's got to have the same amount of energy at the end of the day that it had at the beginning of the day but what it can do is change where that energy is located and so that's what a calculation like this is intended to look for so you probably remember from school uh, that energy comes in two basic types kinetic energy and potential energy kinetic energy almost always looks the same it's always one half times the the thing's mass times its velocity squared well we've got two things in motion we're not worried about that top ball, right? That thing's not moving. Uh, we've got two things moving, the middle ball and the bottom ball. So we've got a kinetic energy for the middle ball and a kinetic energy for the bottom ball. So each one of those is one half mv squared. You just calculate each one and add them together. And then you can also have potential energy, right? Potential energy is where you have energy stored somewhere. Well, one place you can store energy is in a spring. You can think about, you know, compressing a spring, locking it in place, and then waiting for the right moment, you release the latch, and then the spring explodes, and you've got this release of energy. So it's got a similar equation, a suspiciously similar equation that we won't get into the details of here, but that is uh, one half times the spring stiffness times the stretching or compressing amount squared. That's that L minus L zero that we had earlier. Uh, so that is one half K S squared. Here's one half K S K S two squared. Um, and for right now, I'm leaving these springs as identical, you know, assuming that the rope is going to be evenly uh, stiff all the way throughout. It might be fun to make it variable so that would be like you had a string tied to a rope or something like that. And then there's another place you can store 
uh, potential energy, and that's with gravitational potential energy. This is the potential energy associated with you take some, you take a, a book or something, put it, putting it on a shelf, and then you know if there's a little bit of a rumbling, that book can fall down from the shelf. Poor book. Um, books deserve better than that. Uh, even books I don't like deserve better than that. But the the idea is that the, the energy was sort of stored in the height, as it were, and then it falls down. Uh, to the ground gains some kinetic energy. And that's a pretty straightforward thing to calculate. That's going to be the uh, the weight, that's mass times the gravitational field, times the height. Um, <clears throat> so that's all the energy there can be in this system is, is two places for kinetic energy and four places for potential energy. So I'm totaling all that up. If this thing does conserve energy, then this plot of energy versus time should be constant, meaning a flat line, meaning, you know, a constant value. So let's see if that's what we get. We'll run the code again. This time we're going to take a look at the energy diagram. And this thing is looking pretty consistent, right? I mean, that is flat as far as the eye can see. Um, even as this thing's, you know, this thing has gone through a few oscillations now and this thing is, and the, the energy graph is remaining constant. Um, we're in, you know, we're up to, you know, we're past a minute of, of virtual time here. Uh, so I think we're doing, I think we're doing pretty well there. So I take that to mean that I'm appropriately modeling uh, the rope swinging back and forth with this. Um, now, of course, you've seen uh, uh, other interesting plots um, in this, uh, on this channel. Uh, at the end of season one, we started talking about phase space plots. If you need a refresher on that, uh, you know, please go back to uh, the, the last few episodes in season one uh, where we talked about phase space plots. But phase space is where you've got a couple of, 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 of dependent variables. And rather than graphing each in the versus time, you graph one versus the other to get an idea of sort of how the system is traveling throughout its possible configurations. So another name for phase space might be configuration space. What I want to look at here is the angle that each of these springs make. So when you think about a typical pendulum, uh, when you think about a pendulum swinging back and forth, you usually think about the angle that it makes with the vertical. So this would be zero angle, this would be 30, this would be 60, this would be 90, and then back the other way would be negative. So to calculate those, I can just take the arc tangent of the uh, of each of the springs axes, so the directions that the springs that the springs are pointing in the x and y direction. So now instead of an energy plot, let's do a phase space plot. This ought to be fun. Okay, so this thing is swinging back and forth. This graph is going to auto scale uh, for the first little bit of its journey. Um, <clears throat> so this is the angle of, oh, is that the angle of the top one? Uh, this is angle of the Yes, this, excuse me, this is angle of the bottom one versus angle of the top one. So it's angle of the bottom versus angle of the top. Um, and you see it's, it's tracing out this little, you know, hairpin shape here. It's going down into this corner. It comes up around this loop, and then it goes into a different corner to come back around. So that kind of also gives you a picture of conservation of energy, that this thing, you know, it can't get beyond, uh, you know, it can't get beyond this point. It can't get beyond these two sort of clusters here. Um, you can think of each of these as sort of being the turnaround points for each of it. And that matches what we see here where this thing, you know, moves pretty consistently from side to side. So this is neat. That's a neat picture. And of course, phase space gets different depending on um, depending on what the initial conditions are that you give it. So I've already played around and found another interesting initial condition. So I told you earlier that I had these set up so that they were, you know, sort of specifically tailored to not stretch the springs very much. Let's see what happens when I do stretch the springs a bit more and maybe make this a bit more like a non-rope. You can see here you're getting uh, more oscillatory behavior. So now I've stretched the springs more. So these things are going back and forth a bit more. And you notice here we've got kind of a similar hairpin shape, but this thing is, uh, this phase space plot is reflecting the oscillations that the springs are experiencing there. Um, I suppose another interesting way to do the uh, I suppose another interesting way to do the 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 phase space plot would be the length of each spring. That might be interesting. Let's give that one a try. Um, so if I wanted to look at the lengths of the springs, um, <clears throat> instead of plotting these angles, I would just add in a plot command. Uh, let's see, the length of each spring is just spring axis. Well, that's the vector. I want the length, meaning the magnitude. So let's say magnitude of spring, uh, spring dot axis. If I ask for the magnitude of a spring, it's not going to know what to do, but spring axis is a vector, so that it knows what to do with. 
versus magnitude of spring two dot axis. Let's see what this, I haven't tried this out yet, so let's see what this gives me. Um, so again, we're looking at the length of each spring. Okay, and pretty much what you would expect. You know, they are oscillating back and forth. This again gives you a little bit of a picture of conservation of energy because they can't, um, you know, they can't go, you know, they can't both be zero. They can't both be this way. They've got to oscillate this way in order to conserve the energy. Um, let's try one more thing. So that's looking at both the springs. Let's see what happens if I do one of their lengths versus one of their angles. So this is length of the, 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 the top spring, and this is angle of the top spring. Oh, that is fun. That is fun looking. Again, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of conservation of energy because, you know, the trajectory can't leave this little box here. So that box kind of, in, in a very abstract way, represents the, the total energy of the system, right? You can't have zero, zero uh, back over here, for example. Um, so that was pretty cool. Awesome. So I think that'll wrap it up for this time. Uh, we've been going for about 20 minutes now. Um, so next time what we're going to do is we're going to expand the code here. We're going to uh, we're going to expand this to incorporate more atoms, more rope elements. And we're going to do that by turning these, you know, these, these, uh, these variables that I've got into list items. So that way we can have an arbitrary number of, uh, an arbitrary number of spring elements, arbitrary number of atoms. So thank you very much for watching. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.